Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Amit Chaudhary, and I'm a vice president at Neo4j based out of our office in San Mateo. Um, and it's, uh, it's my privilege to come here and, and uh, spend some time with you about our technology as well as how graph databases in general are generally changing the, the data landscape in the market today. A um, couple of things before we get into the details. Um, I know this is, this is, um, this is a, an event that you, know, we, that, that you have joined um, uh, willingly. You know, so we are extremely thankful for the time that you're going to spend today. I know this is a big investment, a whole day. Uh, so we are hoping that you will get the best out of it. And we are also hoping that we're going to present the best of what we have learned over a period of time. Um, more specifically, you know, this graph tour has been going on um, for, for about a year now. So we have visited Stockholm, Milan, you know, Toronto, Seattle, um, and many different places. And I think so what we've done is we have learned a lot of that stuff along the way. So what we're presenting today is, is hopefully the best of the best that we have been able to put together. The second thing that I also want to talk about is I want to be, um, again, you know, this is, this is a very uh, big market for us. New York is an is extremely important market. There are some really good customers and accounts that we have. So what I would strongly encourage you is that at the lunchtime or during the break, you know, take a look around you uh, in terms of the companies that have been represented. You know, Bloomberg, UBS, Citibank, JP Morgan. I mean, there are many of them. So these are incredibly big accounts as well as uh, customers who have had the opportunity to use some of our technology or are in the process of using that technology. So let's talk a little bit about what our agenda for today is. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Graph, you know, just to a baselining. Some of you have been using it, and some of them, some of you are probably in the process of understanding what Graphs is, or perhaps are evaluating some of the different ways Graphs can help uh, your data requirements. Uh, I'm going to spend some time on the data management trends. We're going to talk a little bit about case studies, and then we talk a little bit about what's the future for Graph. All right, so let's talk about what is Graph. But even before we go there, let's talk a little bit about what's happening in the market today. Our data, you know, data, everybody, I'm sure everybody has heard about this, firm, uh, this, this statement, data is the new oil. Well, it's true, because data drives pretty much all the decision making individually or as an, in the enterprise. But if you think about what is happening in the market today is that our, the nature of our data is changing. You know, it's the volume and velocity of uh, the data from you know, different places, social networks, sensors, even uh, incredibly from our websites. I mean, the, 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 in, the nature has completely changed from what the data was about 30 years ago. And it's also important to remember that the, the quality and the, and the, uh, the entire uh, way data has changed our decision making has also uh, uh, gone through some order of transformation. So in the earlier times when people used to think about relational databases, that used to be very st static data and that had to be stored in rows and columns. But think about it. Think about it in your, your own day-to-day uh, -day life. When you think about data, Data is not rows and columns. Data is all about relationships. Data is all about connection between different data points. And that's the quality and the volume and, and the, so to say, the inherent nature of data that we're talking about is changing. So if you think about network of people or um, you know, business processes or even for that matter, um, knowledge things, we, these are all interconnectedness. You know, the, 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 the onus is not on how we store and save the data, it's also about how we get to find the value between the different data points. And that's what Graphs is all about. So what's a graph database? So a graph database is basically a form of a database which uses the graph um, semantics, and the data is stored in nodes and relationships. So we have two different nodes, and nodes represent people, place, or a thing. It could be anything. But it's about the relationship between them that is extremely important. And that is also a priority, which means that while the nodes or, or the, the single unit objects are important to recognize what they are and what they do, the more important piece is what connects them and what is the value that we can find out of it. And this is exactly that value that determines uh, how we find 
uh, you know, relationships between them and what kind of, of knowledge we can unearth between the different uh, relationships of these, these nodes. So in practical use, you know, let's talk about a little bit of, of where Graph has basically made a huge impact. You know, Frederick Overmeyer, he is a journalist, and in one of his talks, he has talked about the fact that there hasn't been any major political news in the last 10, 15 years which has not, not connected to relationships, which is not because of relationships. So take a step back and think about all the proceedings that are happening in, in Washington, D.C. these days. Plus, think about what we have seen of major news events in the past. There is always a relationships. There's always relationships behind them that has made the impact. So no matter what happens in the front, what we hear, you peel the onion and you realize this, that at the end of the day, it's all about the connectedness and it's all about the relationship of different data points that has led to a, the series of events that get reported in the market. And one of the most important piece that we have talked about, which is a big example, is, is the Panama Papers. How many of you are aware of Panama Papers? Well, in this market, absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, this thing happened in 2016, but it's the, the impact of this is reverberating even today. You know, we have many different world leaders who have been deposed, who have basically been impacted because of what came out of Panama, Panama Papers. And, and it's, it's, it's an incredible story, not just uh, you know, because of the investigative journalism that happened. It also is a representation of a technology that was instrumental in, in making that happen. So let's talk a little bit about what happened. So basically we had about 2.6 terabytes of data that got leaked out. You know, it got leaked out, that translated about more than 11 million uh, pieces of, of information. These were transactions, these were deeds, these were legal papers, these were bank accounts, things are like that. And, and it's, it's an immensely um, complicated set of documents that perhaps nobody can sit on the tables and start highlighting about w what's going on. I mean, these were very complicated set of different ways of, of how people have connected each other and things like that. But it was not very visible to begin with. When you see 11.5 million pe uh, pieces of paper, it's just very hard to go through them one by one and determine the impact. Well, let's talk about what it was essentially. It was about people. You know, everything is, is at the end of the day connected to people. And this could be a person, this could be somebody who essentially has a bank account or a checking account or an investment account in some place. But that person also has an address. And in that address, that person is staying with a partner or a wife or somebody else who happens to work in a company that has an offshore account. So if you take that, this is essentially a data model that was determined uh, as you go through these papers. But if you, take a, if you abstract this out, this essentially is about what we call about um, nodes and the relationships. And you know, I talked about node could be a place or a person or a thing. In this case, node was an address, node was a person, node was a, uh, was a person who they were staying with or what kind of account they had. But it was more important is what kind of a relationship was there between these different nodes that essentially allowed them to figure out where the uh, shady deals were and how people were impacted and how people were connected with each other. So if you kind of think about this in, in, in a smaller sense, this is just one data model. The relationships, the, the connectedness between a few different nodes. Imagine this in, in billions and tens of billions of, of, of connections. This is what graph database allows you to do it. So if you, I don't think any technology for that matter or for that meaning in the last 30 or 40 years has come out that can actually parse this information in the way graph has been able to do that. You know, it can store the information. You know, I'm sure it, there is a, there's a way for it to, um, to find some value in that as well. But if you have to find relationships and if you have to find meaning, you know, graph databases is, is, is are exactly designed for these kind of workloads. So what really transpired, you know, uh, the former Icelandic prime minister, Sigmundur um, Gustafsson, you know, he, he basically got deposed uh, and, and the relationships were found out, you know, and we had a few changes even in other countries, uh, you know, uh, Prime Minister of Pakistan was also deposed because of that. So there is a lot of, 
of, of these things that came out. Um, and, and what really happened was Neo4j was essentially um, you know, responsible for helping the, the, the teams uh, to depo so decompose that information. We used uh, different sets of, of open source technology to parse over this information and then put it together to find uh, real meaning. And you know, obviously, this became a big news that was in every single newspaper in the world and you know, obviously had a Pulitzer Prize. So in, in a practical sense, graph database really brought together something which perhaps before this was, was hard to do it. You know, but it's not like we find investigative journalism as use cases every day. Um, you know, there have been some really good ones, but by and large, a lot of what we do is also very applicable in commercial sense. And these are some of the common graph use uh, cases that I want to talk about. You know, one of them is, is the word recommendation engine. And Walmart is doing a great job of of using the information of what people talk about when they return things, what kind of feedback they give, and using that all in a, in a excuse me, in a set of um, different analyses to be able to come out with the right recommendation engine. The second is fraud protection. You know, ETA, a Brazilian bank, um, they're using graph database to be able to do fraud detection. So anything, you know, one of the use cases which is remarkable is that any use case, any fraud, which could have probably taken about 10 to 12 days, now can be detected within 30 minutes just because of the way graph data model allows them to find different connection points and things happening at the real time. Uh, we talk about HP and, and network and IT operations. Actually, network and IT operations is a very graph fee kind of a use case. You know, if you think about how networks are connected, you know, uh, some of our uh, telecom partners as well as um, uh, technology companies, they're using graph to understand the whole network topology. They're looking at how are the balancing of networks happen, where are the single points of failures, how to prevent these things. So that's a, that's a very important use case that we had talked about. Uh, master data management, that's another use case where, you know, if you think about in the world of, of, of where we are today, GDPR and, and, you know, forget me every time kind of a requirements, you know, your information is available across many different places and, and is, uh, is available in different databases. And if you do not have the ability to make those point changes when, uh, when, 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 it, when it's required, then I think you might be in, in violation of some of the, the new regulations that have been put in place. So how do, you, how do companies manage these master data ma management things is something that's it's a very graphy problem. Another one that I want to talk about is excuse me, is also about knowledge graphs. Knowledge graphs, you know, is essentially um, data warehousing. You know, think about, it's the map of your, uh, of, of your data, of your knowledge. It's a graphic map of your, of your knowledge, in, and, and that could be a data warehouse. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done or has been done in trying to put together that information uh, with some of our accounts, uh, such as Airbnb. And last but not the least is, is about um, identity and access management. And, and UBS, which is represented here, has been using uh, Neo4j to be able to have um, uh, an understanding of, of, of different uh, you know, authentications, different authorizations, and different checkpoints, and, and what different set of, of, of people or, or um, groups have access to different information within the network. So one of the things that has also happened is that uh, suddenly, uh, the analysts have woken up about the potential uh, and the advantages of graph. So in 2017, Forrester made this prediction that 25% of the enterprises will be using graph databases by 2017. You know, one of the funny things is that they very quickly changed that to more than 50%. And part of the reason is, is exactly it is. It is about the fact that, you know, how it's not, again, uh, you know, every database Every kind of a technology, you know, Dave talked about different data models that DB engines uh, look at. You know, it's not that those are wrong or those do not serve a purpose. They do. But if, when you're looking at many different complicated data points, what is important is what is the relationship between them. And today, the value is in finding those relationships and extracting that and presenting it in the manner that allows you to make the right decisions at the right point of time. So that's why Forrester... Um, you know, they, they, they up their uh, prediction from 25% to 50%. We talk about 
uh, popularity of graph. You know, this is something that Dave has already talked about. So just to kind of give a sense, data, uh, DB engines, what they do is they look at, uh, they have a very scientific way of algorithmically looking at uh, how different companies uh, are evaluating different database technologies. You know, it's based on number of job openings, number of site visits, number of, uh, of, of meetups. I mean, it's a very, very scientific way that they come together, they aggregate this piece of information, and they put it in an algorithm, and then they come out with the answer. So, you know, if you think about it, this is where graph database is high, and, and relational databases uh, continue to be on a, pretty much of a flat line. You know, the reality is that today's data is so complicated uh, and it's the volume and, and velocity is coming in that the relational databases or some of the other databases are not in a position to, um, to take, I mean, they're not designed to take advantage of, of all the pieces that are coming together and graph databases. And that's, that's the reason that the popularity of graphs has been increasing. Um, even Gartner, uh, you know, which is usually a predictor of present technologies, uh, is essentially looked at graph as uh, an important trend in 2016. So all in all, you know, I think the, the point that we're trying to make here is that you know, this, is, this is an incredible time for graph. We are super excited about it, and, and we're super excited to have you here because you are also evaluating graph based on some of these predictions that you would have heard or, or understood or listened from uh, from your colleagues or some of the other folks within the industry. And it's an incredible opportunity to take advantage of these technologies and see what different uh, you know, uh, value you are able to get out of the different databases and the data models and, and data points that you have within your organization. You know what, while graph is one strong point within the data industry, there's also been some, some very incredible failures. Um, and one of the things that comes to my mind is, is, is the Hadoop experience. How many of you have deployed Hadoop or had deployed Hadoop? Fairly well. You know, when Hadoop came in the market uh, about, I don't know, maybe about 10 years ago or so, uh, it came with a bang. It was a massive explosion. You know, it was, it was one of those more re remarkable technologies that everybody, and you know, coming from, from Silicon Valley, you know, you know how the hype cycle works. Everybody was on the Hadoop cycle. But it was, it, you know, what happened? You know, last year, exactly about a year ago, October 18th, I think, if I remember the time, is this announcement happened. Horton, Hortonworks and Cloudera merger is actually Hadoop's obituary. I mean, this is a very dark statement that came out by some of the analysts, which basically said that, you know, it's like if one brick is sinking, you tie the two bricks together, they don't sink any faster. I mean, it's, it's like a... Uh, one of the dark uh, declarations of, of the Hadoop industry. But I think, you know, just as the hype was overblown, you know, the, um, the so to say, the decline is also overblown. Of course, you know, Cloudera CEO quit, the guy who basically brought these together, and then a 25% of the value tanked in, in a single day. Uh, you know, some of the, uh, the impact was also looked at at MAPR before it, got acquired by HP. But the reality, what you know, I think we are trying to put together here is that um, there's no technology today, perhaps, that had this single biggest rise and fall of, of what we call as the hype cycle. And part of it is because of the hype that got created, and part of it is, is because of how the, the market suddenly changed. When I say the market, it's, it's the nature of data. And I'm pretty sure all of you will recognize what I'm talking about in terms of, of how you are required to process the data as much as the, the value that you're going to get out of the data. So Gartner obviously has this, this diagram. I'm sure all of you have seen this. This is called the hype cycle. Everything that comes out is evaluated on this hype cycle. You know, uh, whether it's AI, machine learning. I mean, I can tell you that graph databases are on a hype cycle as well. Um, Hadoop was on it, but the, the 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 important reality is that you know this is this is a a very good way to have a mental map of how the technologies are going to evolve, and and you know by and large they do that. You know Hadoop was one story that essentially did not follow this path because of many different reasons, and they eventually ended up in a situation where today it's good for a purpose. 
it's not good for everything, it's good for a purpose. No technology is a panacea for everything that people are looking at. Obviously, there are going to be some strong points and, 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 and weaknesses, but at the end of the day, we have to recognize that um, every technology has a purpose, every database has a purpose, but one thing which is critical among all databases is, is where is the relationship coming together between different data points and what is the value that comes out of it. Now one of you can stand up and basically say, so why do we think graph databases are gonna be successful? You know, if you think about following this hype cycle, we could possibly have the same storyline, possibly, but I think the reason why we are super confident about where we are is not because that it's not something that just got dropped in as a big bang explosion. You know, we have been evaluating, and this thing has been churning around within academic circles, uh, data scientist world, in the developer ecosystems for the last 10 years. So what we have seen from a graph database standpoint is, is it has been tried, it has tested, it has scaled, it has been evaluated, it has been turned, twisted many different times, and finally we have broken it out into the commercial market over the last few years, and, and, and the success has been astounding. So there is an inherent confidence in our ability to believe that graph databases are going to be successful because they solve a purpose that no other database today does, which is about the relationships, the connectedness of data. And in fact, a lot of, from a graph standpoint, I would say is that what graph databases allow is it, it makes people, it gets people make sense of their data. And that's exactly the reason why graph databases are a long way to go. Um, and you know, it's not just about me saying because I'm representing Neo4j. It's about the fact that if you think about how the demand skills are being addressed in the market today. So Upwork, how many of you have, uh, know about Upwork? Very few. So Upwork is basically, um, uh, you know, it's kind of a freelancing site. So if you're looking for some freelancing projects and you're looking for to be done in a timely way and it's across the world, uh, you know, Upwork is a great way. In fact, if you would, you know, you should go to Upwork and check it out as well. But one of the things that, if you remember here, if you see here is that of the top 20 skills that people are looking at, Neo4j, um, Salesforce Lightning, Moz, I mean, these are incredible amount of of, of, I would say, validation of what people today are looking at in terms of building their um, skill sets as well as what companies are looking for, in, uh, for, for these people. So, you know, uh, excited, I'm very excited about the way we are moving in this direction uh, from a graph database standpoint. Now let's talk a little bit about something that, has, that happened in the last two weeks that has, hasn't happened in the last 30 years. You know, I want to, perhaps some of you are already aware of it, but I want to still make an announcement that we have worked with the ISO body for, I've been doing it for many, many years along with some of our very strategic partners to essentially push the standards for graph. Just as SQL, which was a standard query language for relational databases that was approved 30 years ago, the ISO body actually approved GQL as a graph query language, uh, um, and it hasn't happened in 30 years, about two weeks ago, which to me is such an incredible recognition of graph as a storyline <laughs> because of the fact that what it does is that it establishes a standard for now to, uh, companies and people just like yours to essentially use graph. So what you have, the advantage is that you, you are you have skills that can be used across the board. Uh, there's no vendor lock-in, and more importantly, your applications are, are open source now. So this is an incredible uh, opportunity that is offered uh, because of, of the fact that it's important, graphs have become extremely important, and most of the organizations now look at as a standard for developing a lot of these things. So uh, great thanks to you, and, and of course, it's a, it's a big achievement for us, uh, as well as some of the other folks in the, in the graph industry. 
This is um, a representation, graph representation I would like to talk about. You know, Cypher is something that got innovated and came out of Neo4j, and, and, and we've been kind of open sourced it. We have always been an open source company. We open sourced it to some of our other partners who kind of took this up. Uh, Oracle and, and SAP and, and some of the other ones, and the effort together essentially led to ISO, which is a consortium of many different countries, to recognize GQL as, um, as, as the standard language for, for graph. Now, what does it mean? You know, this is a very busy slide that is provided to our, by our incredible partners, GraphAware, who, you know, who basically sleep, eat, uh, graph on a day-to-day -day basis. But what it essentially talks about is the ecosystem. So it's not just about the database. It's about what happens before and what happens after. So you have ETL tools, or you have visualization partners, you have um, uh, you know, many different other implementation partners as well. So this is a massive ecosystem of graph that personally I, did, I wasn't aware of before I joined Neo4j. But if you think about it, this is, this is how the industry is gonna grow, and now with the standards body coming together, it essentially is gonna get even more um, uh, robust and uh, 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 and, and expansive. Um, talk a little bit about our Google partnership. You know, this is more closer to where we are heading towards. You know, we tied this, uh, we had this uh, announcement uh, way back in March and, or April in, at uh, Google Next. You know, we are incredibly proud to be part of the six database vendors, open source database vendors that Google Cloud basically chose to uh, uh, offer their first party offerings on to the enterprise customers. We are working towards this. And um, you know, over the next few months, we'll be making some incredible announcements in terms of where we're going. Obviously, being on Google allows us to um, use and leverage some of, of our incredible uh, graph capabilities on their uh, super high performing uh, cloud machines to be able to uh, offer to our customers uh, a fully integrated setup where billing and everything is, 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 is all going to be uniform. So this is, this is a great opportunity for a lot of our customers to use this in, in, in the cloud area. Um, enterprise, 76% of the Fortune 100 customers are already using it. Um, you know, the, this, is, this is a testament to the fact that this is open source, um, but more importantly, in terms of where we are, how we have developed, we talked about that slide around the ecosystem. Uh, you know, enterprise need ecosystem for technology to, to flourish, and the results are very much in, 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 um, in front of you. You know, one of the, one of the darlings of, of the st startup era, Essentially, Lyft, you can't call it as a startup anymore, but Lyft is an example of where somebody from the startup world actually looked at uh, Neo4j or Graph and essentially um, became extremely successful. Now, we're not gonna take credit for Lyft's success because of Graph, but they, they, there is a, you know, a little bit of a pride in the fact that having used Graph and Neo4j, they've been able to kind of come out of the, the startup world and essentially been successful and, and got listed here in the stock exchange. So I'm going to uh, you know, very quickly go through some of the case studies. Um, you know, we talked about commercial use cases. We talked about six of those cases that uh, are common use cases in the past. But I want to talk a little bit of, of what we have done, uh, uh, which is more visible. And I think this is going to be relevant for a lot of you who are evaluating and learning about graphs today. Um, and and you know, we, we will strongly encourage you to go to our website and, and, and download these case studies and, or talk to any one of us. We are, we are available here. Um, so the German Center for Diabetes Research is a great user and, and have been a big um, ambassador for, for us, Neo4j, and for the graph. Uh, part of it is because what they've done is they've taken many different years of, of diabetic research and put together in a more graphical form to say, okay, how do many different components within these research elements connect with each other and can they solve a diabetic problem? And you know, this is one of the uh, more, uh, just like Panama Papers was one end of the spectrum, uh, it, you know, this is the other end of the spectrum from a humanity standpoint. This is a great example of how Graph is, is helping develop some of uh, more advanced medical research. Uh, Caterpillar is, is another uh, enterprise customer of ours, and what they're doing, they're using Graph for uh, kind of building a map of, of different maintenance technologies that, uh, sorry, maintenance that they have been doing for their machines. You know, when, when machines come back for repair or for any of the servicing, what oil change you happened, what kind of a fix you did, what was the problem, X, Y, Z. You know, put those things together in a more graphical form and you essentially can predict the maintenance model for, for many different models. Xfinity is another example. You know, they obviously have uh, one of the largest um, 
cable providers, and they have many different services. So if you, they have a project called the, the Smart Hub, and Smart Hub talks about many different uh, Xfinity products that can be put together from a customer use. Like, think about a customer 360, but within the cable world, and, and if I'm on some network that's just running cable, uh, uh, you know, Comcast network, how uh, you know, my playlist could be used with somebody else on that network to put together something which is very unique. So they, these are very different smart technologies that are being put together by, uh, by Xfinity. Very quickly on the future of graphs, there is, a, there is a session that Jennifer is going to be running in the afternoon that is going to talk about uh, where uh, AI and graph come together. This is just a very quick introduction to the fact that graph databases and the way the models are processed actually are driving a lot of the AI adoption. You know, we have seen the papers that have come together. We talked about the graph algorithm, uh, algorithm book, which has been downloaded, and all the data scientists and AI experts have come to me for uh, our website to download these things and understand more. A part of the reason is, is because that the, the modeling that, that is required, you know, you need to have more refined data models to be able to get more predictive learning within AI and machine learning, and graphs are incredibly useful to be able to get that thing together. So, you know, the, uh, the market sees a strong synergy between graphs and, and artificial intelligence, and that's where the future is, but don't go by me, go by a Jennifer session in the afternoon and, and understand more about that. Um, you know, this is um, a quote that, um, uh, uh, you know, has been put together by, um, uh, by one of the sociologists from, from Berkeley, and he's talking about the fact that, you know, from an, if you're looking from an AI and machine learning standpoint uh, and relationship standpoint, it's not important about me per se um, that you need to look at where my predictions are going to go. You have to look at my relationship. So if, I, if somebody has to determine, you know, who is going to vote in which way and who is going to get impacted in which way, rather than, than the person themselves, you basically need to look at the relationships, and that's going to determine how, um, uh, uh, you know, that's going to determine their behavior. So, which is exactly the point that we talked about earlier, is that the graph databases is all about relationships. The relationships are more important, and more important than the nodes itself, and that's, that's a, a more a stronger prediction of a behavior than actually the individual itself. All right, to wrap up, uh, I want to talk about Graph Connect. It's happening in New York in April. Um, you know, we are expecting about 1,000, uh, more than 1,000 people. It's, it's going to be a phenomenal, um, uh, you know, event talking about industry leaders as well as, you know, developments in the graph technology and some of the bright and the brightest of, of Neo4j and within the industry are going to be presenting. And I'm extremely excited about, uh, you know, letting you know and looking forward to seeing you uh, over there in, in April. And last but not least, I want to also thank our sponsors, uh, EY and Neoris, as well as Graph Aware and Lincurious. You know, they, they, have, they have been incredible partners. They have been the reason why we have been successful. Uh, and and I, I just want to uh, you know, thank uh, them for all the work they have done and continue to do. And we believe these are going to be strong partnerships in the days to come. Thank you. <laughs>